saluted one of my sporting heroes this evening, the great Eddie Merckx. We talked about his uh, career, his records, 525 victories. I'm just going to roll out a few figures for you right now before I ask this uh, gentleman to come and stand up alongside me. 206 victories. I'm sure he'll disagree with that, but as far as I'm concerned, in my record book, Robbie McEwen won 260, 206 professional races. And number 12 seems to crop up all of the time. 12 individual stages at the Giro d'Italia. 12 individual stages at the Tour de France. Uh, and of course, let's not forget, 12 individual stages at the Santos Tour now down under. Each one of those a record for an Australian. Well done, Robbie. Woohoo! Australian ever, not just to win the green jersey for the points competition, the most consistent daily finisher, but to win the green jersey at the Tour de France on three occasions. Please come up and join me, Mr. Robbie McEwen. Mario Cipollini, Alessandro Pataki, and you've had the chance to go up against all of those greats, and even now, in recent years, the great Mark Cavendish. You've never had that lead-out train, which I think coins the ligand to talk about the invisibility cloak of Harry Potter. You seem to always come from nowhere. How is that possible? You do what you have to do sometimes. I mean, it came out of necessity, and I think just the way I grew up on a BMX bike, uh, I've always been a bit of an individual, uh, finding my own way through the pack. And uh, when I started cycling, it was it was no different. And you come up through the amateurs, you don't have a team, you have to find your own way. And although I've won a lot of races, it, it looks like I've done it all alone. I mean, I get to the line on my own and. The sprinter always gets the glory, but there's a, there's a lot of people behind it. And I, I think the art of making it look like I'm doing it on my own is using teammates to do all the hard work, that invisible work. Yeah. They're the ones who are invisible. And, uh, and it's up to me then when I cross the line and, and get to the end to really thank them because it's, it's those guys that put you in the position to be able to do those little things in the end. And you know, nobody does it all alone. It's a long time since you deserve the Champion always, always salutes his teammates because, as uh, Phil and I always try to say in the commentary when we're, when we're trying to commentate, um, we see the individual glory of some of these great champions, but there is no chance, and as Eddie Merckx, I'm sure, will admit, as Matty Goss will admit, there's no chance of individual glory without a great team behind him. And um, Robbie, winning the Tour de France stages is something very special, but I think for a, for a sprinter, the, the one everybody wants to win is the Champs Elysees, and I think we saw the excitement when you won there on the Champs Elysees. Most definitely, oh, I'm glad they actually took it easy with that video because it's one that I really look like to. But, uh, <laughs> but you, you do, you get excited. I mean, as, as a sprinter or you know, whatever your specialty is in, in cycling, you you aim at that one special win, and, and it's one I've been dreaming of. You dream of heading to a stage. I wouldn't have cared if it was you know, not even in France. Wouldn't no matter where it was, if I could have won a Tour de France stage, it would have just made my whole career, my whole sporting life. And that I got to get the very first one on the Champs Elysees there in '99, I just, yeah, I went a little bit crazy. <laughs> and I think we, uh, we we all understand why. But for, for many of the guys, and there's many great champions sitting in the room here this evening, just getting to the Champs Elysees is a special thing for the Tour, just finishing there, just getting onto those hallowed cobblestones. But for a sprinter, You've got to hold back, you've got to be careful, you've got to wait and, and ride that final stage in a very special way. It puts a lot of pressure onto you. The elation of crossing the line in first place must be incredible. It, it is, but like you said, it's a very special thing just getting to Paris, especially in your first tour. And uh, Stu and I, we actually did our first tour together back in 97. And you're not even thinking about that final stage, you're just thinking of making it to the end of every day. And there's, there's so much suffering going on through the mountains for the sprinters. Uh, you know, some people like to say, oh, they're in the laughing group or the bus or whatever they like to call that, that, fond, that last group, the group that don't. 
but you're racing from start to finish just to make it on time. And you know, there's a nasty commissaire there with a the clock, and he's counting it down. And if you're outside, you've gone home. So you're not just thinking about that that last day. You're thinking, I want to stay in this race. And and I really understood Eddie very well when he said about his, his broken cheekbone, his bad injuries, he, and he didn't want to pull out because you worked so hard to get to the tour. It's, it's the holy grail of cycling. You don't just pull out of it. No, you don't, but I've never really understood why do they call it the laughing group? Because it's not very funny at the back of the balance. There's absolutely no laughing going on at all. <laughs> that clock, and just for any of you who've uh, never raced in the Tour de France, uh, <laughs> Alan Piper's in the room here somewhere. I remember one time with Alan Piper just watching the barriers coming down. We ducked underneath it. We were very lucky not to get eliminated. But it's, it, there's a fraternity, isn't it, in the Tour de France? When, when you ride the Tour, when you finish the Tour, um, on those mountain stages, all of the sprinters, all of the guys who can't get over the mountains, they, you've got to help yourselves. You've got to, you, you've got to get the whole group inside. It is a little bit like a love-hate relationship. I mean, the flat stages, you hate each other. You just, you want to beat each other. That's the competition you'll do. You'll give them nothing. But in the mountains, you actually will support each other. You, you sort of will back it off a little bit if there's someone in real trouble of going out the back of the group. Um, you know, you pass the drinks around, you share a coke. Um, and there's a story about sharing a coke with Stuart O'Grady actually last year in Tour de Suisse, but I just can't tell it to you. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's for the um, that's for the X-rated edition. Um, Robbie, you sprinted. Alessandro Pataki, you sprinted against him. Um, Mario Cipollini. Who was the greatest sprinter that you really got a lot of pressure how to beat him? I think the one that gave me the most pleasure, and uh, I think at the, the time itself, probably the most surprise that I'd actually done it was uh, back in 02 in the Giro d'Italia when I, I finally beat Mario Cipollini. Uh, we were coming in uh, to stage four in De Strasbourg in the first three days. I was, I was going really well. I felt good. I thought, I can, I can beat this guy. I look at his long hair and his God in Italy and all that. And for three days in a row, he just absolutely smashed us. And on day four, I finally got the better of him, and uh, I, you know, I rode on the back of his train, and they did an absolutely perfect lead out. We we're doing about 70k an hour leading into the sprint, and he started the sprint. And I thought, well, this is the moment we'll pull out to the side and have a go, and I actually managed to pass him. And uh, I was coming past, and I thought, wow, that's Mario. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds easy, doesn't it? But the number of times that I finished second or third or fourth or, or way further back than that when he was the one on, the, on his way to the podium and uh, kissing the girls and all that sort of stuff and you know, wearing funny t-shirts and togas and whatever and I saw him win that many races in front of me so you know, it did give me a bit of pleasure to, to get one or two. One thing he never did though, Mario Cipollini. Super Mario Cipollini won over 40 stages in the Giro d'Italia. Never won the green jersey at the Tour de France. That the green jersey, you think about it, it's, you know, you just get up every day and have a bit of a sprint. But it's actually, sometimes, I think sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to try and win the green jersey than actually the yellow jersey. Because you've got to be battling every day for the intermediate sprints, the final sprints. It's a tough jersey to win. It is a very, very difficult competition. I, I wouldn't say it's harder than winning the yellow jersey. I mean, that's, that's a whole different thing. I mean, they're almost two different sports racing for those two jerseys. But going for green, it, uh, it is a case of having to be consistent, but consistently very good. Uh, you have to be up there every single day. You can't afford to miss a point. Uh, if you're going for the yellow jersey and you, you know, clip out of your pedal into the sprint, you lose three seconds, your tour's not over. But if you're going into a sprint finish and you clip your foot out and you don't score any points that day, it's finished, green jersey over. That's the, the little difference between those two competitions. You've got time over three weeks for the yellow jersey to correct the situation, take a few seconds back here or there, but uh, if you lose big points one day for green, then it, it is all over and you can forget about it for another year. Uh, one maybe an indiscreet question. You, when you look at the sprinters, you've got the big chaps like Greipel. Vossi himself is quite a big lad. How does a little chap like you get up in the sprints? Well, there's some gaps that they just can't fit through. <laughs> Robbie, you had your fair share of injury. Um, Eddie talked about his injury and, and how it um, pretty much might have changed his career, but just looking back, 97, you broke your collarbone, 99, you smashed your knee on the team bus. And then in 09, uh, Tour of Belgium, you had a horrific crash. 
I think, I might correct me if I'm wrong, and you usually do correct me when I'm wrong, um, you were getting to the point where you were thinking about um, retiring from sport, um, but that nasty injury, and, and you smashed your, your knee up into a number of pieces, you managed to stitch it back together with a bit of metal here and a few rods there. Um, did that change something in the, the reason for you continuing to race? Well, that injury in 09 of the Tour of Belgium, I, I hit a barrier with my knee. I, I didn't actually crash, but it, it did smash my tibia and, uh, and uh, damaged my patella tendon quite badly. And I had seven months of rehab before I could actually even line up for a race again. And at that moment when I hit that barrier, and I, I looked down and I saw my knee hanging open and, and felt the excruciating pain and couldn't get my foot out of the pedal. I couldn't even move it. And they you know, put me in the ambulance, took me up to hospital. I was, you know, I was screaming with pain. I've never felt anything like it. And the doctor came in pre-op and, and they said, look, it looks like you've uh, actually snapped the tendon. I thought, right, then the tip, my cycling through is over. And I actually shed a tear or two. But when I came out, they said, oh, we, we had a good look. We've, we've stitched everything up, put everything back in place fix the bone with a few big screws and your tendon's okay and well you might not race again but you'll probably be able to ride a bike. Well, that's how dramatic the crash was. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, they had to go back and do some corrective surgery after that. And not only did you walk again, you rode a bike again and you put it in your mind that that was no way for the guy who'd won 200 bike races in his career could, could walk away from the sport. You in fact then decided that you wanted to ride for an extra year, maybe an extra two years. I just decided that moment when they said it will function, you'll be able to ride a bike again, maybe not race. The only thought went through my head is I'm back in business, I'll race again. And I mean, it, it was seven long months of rehab and, and a lot of pain, and uh, I was probably the biggest pain. I was sitting at home for seven months, and you can ask my wife how painful I was. <laughs> she told me a little earlier. <laughs> All that bad luck actually has, has turned into some good luck. Um, last year you raced on Radio Shack with Lance Armstrong and that was his last year. And during the course of this year something I think very special has happened for Australian cycling. Uh, Green Edge was uh, created as a dream last year. We talked about it for 12 months. Now all of a sudden Green Edge, the Australian cycling team, has been born this year. It's been born at the national championships, but at this race here, you guys, and especially you, Stewie O'Grady, the guys who have dreamed about, you're actually this year going to, going to live a dream. It is, it's a cliche, but it is a dream come true. Like you said, in, in 09 after that accident, I thought my career was over. I didn't want to go out like that, and I was desperate to be back in racing, and uh, you know, I got back on the bike. Then I signed with an Australian team that didn't happen. I was left high and dry, no contract. I sent a message to a mate of mine called Lance and uh, they got me a spot on the Radio Shack team for last year and uh, I'm still in the sport, I'm really enjoying it. I think that's, that's the biggest thing about cycling for me, the, the passion I have for the sport and I just love racing, I love being a part of it and I may not win as much as I used to but I still really enjoy it and the little thing that always kept me going, there was always this lure of it's getting closer and closer that, that we're going to have an Australian team. And as last year progressed, uh, we got to the tour down under as a member of Radio Shack, and then came the announcement, Green Edge. I, I've got to do another year. I've got to be a part of it. It's something I've wanted to be a part of, I've dreamt of since I turned pro. Uh, probably the, the best couple of years of my whole career was when I was an amateur, fun-wise and enjoyment-wise, was just riding with all my mates in the national team. And we were trekking around Europe, living out of a suitcase, uh, living in these broken down little sports schools in uh, East Germany and in the middle of nowhere. Oh yeah, all the really good places. And uh, you know, a bit of funding uh, through the AIS, but a, a lot of our own as well. But they were the best years. And I turned pro, I rode for big teams, I rode for the Dutch, the Belgians, the Russians, the Americans. But I always wanted to have that feeling again, that, that national team feeling. And thanks to the, the hard work, the belief, the passion and, and the generosity, uh, in particular of a guy like Jerry Ryan, 
uh, the team is finally off the ground. And you heard just before when, when Matt said uh, we're going to go out and try and win this race tomorrow for Green Edge, it sounds like we've got a couple of supporters around the place. <laughs> Final questions uh, before I let you go because he actually has to race tomorrow and he has to think about uh, uh, defending that overall lead of Simon Gerrits. Um, Liggett and myself, we always get very excited when we commentate the sprints. I was never in your league, but I always tried to mix it a little bit at the end and got excited and motivated by the sprints. Can you? I think sometimes sprinters have to check out their brain when they get to three or four hundred meters to go. Just take us through the last. The last 500 metres of a stage finish of the Tour de France, what, what's going through your mind? How do you react, or is it just instinct? It, it's a combination of instinct and experience. The more you've done it, the more information you've stored about all the sprints you've done, all the rivals you've had, what's going on, what might happen, what you definitely know is going to happen. But for myself, I just get incredibly focused. It's like I'm riding in a tunnel. And when I've done things right, and I'm getting to the front, if I get into clear space and I'm going to win that, that tunnel suddenly opens into wide space and I'm, I'm back in daylight. But until then, I, yeah, it's sort of like being possessed a little bit. And then the other springs will, will probably verify that. You, you do need to take big risks sometimes, uh, but you just have to have incredible focus and a mix with a bit of aggression. Because if you don't have that, then you're going to be starting way back and never win. So it's a, it's a funny feeling. It's, it's really hard to explain what, what you're going through in those last 500 metres, but if you're, if you're thinking too much, you can outthink yourself. When, you, um, when I think about Eddie Merckx, he was somebody I looked at and thought, wow, unbelievable. Um, for a lot of Australians, they looked at Alan Piper or Phil Anderson as the guys, well, if they can race in Europe, I can go over there and do it. When I look at the, the number of Australian professionals now, I, I think about the sprinters and the great sprinters that are out there. And of course, uh, you have been a, a model to all of those guys who are coming up today. Uh, do you understand the position that you have in the, the minds of all these young kids coming forward? Your phone's ringing, by the way. So I'm just going to switch my phone off so it doesn't ring while we're doing this thing. No, but uh, he actually he left his on vibrate, that's why he's smiling. Touche. <laughs> uh, to come back, do you understand and do you realise the position that you play in the, in the, in the minds of these young kids like, like Magic Goss, Lee Howard? Uh, more and more I'm coming to that realisation and that's also one of the things that I spoke about at length uh, with Shane Bannon, with Neil Stevens, with Matthew White, uh, the people who set up the Green Edge team. They wanted to have me on the team, maybe not as much for my riding as for the effect I, I may be able to have on the younger guys. Uh, I guess you could explain my role in the team at the moment for the first half of the season as rider coach out on the road. So out there just making those little adjustments, trying to help the, particularly the younger guys, the sprinters, a guy like Lee Howard for instance. And as we get further down the track towards the Tour de France, which I won't ride this year, but I will be there as a member of the team, uh, in a role which you may have seen Eric Sarbel doing at HTC. So I'll be the guy getting to the finish hours ahead, maybe a day ahead, scouting the finish and giving that information back to the guys, trying to arm them with that little something extra that they can use what I tell them about the finish, know a little bit more than the others, and they win by a millimetre, I'm going to feel great. But I just know that Eric Sarvel's going to be out there doing the same job again, and it could be fireworks. <laughs> Robbie, uh, you went up against Eric Sarvel on a number of occasions too. Is that that new role? Because Robbie will not retire com from competitive cycling until the end of the Hampton Tour of California in May. Um, will that excitement still be there when you're, you're, you're telling Matty Goss how the corner is? 250 metres to go, how the wind is going to be, what type of tyres that Mark Cavendish is using on a particular stage, will, will that fire still be there in the belly but in a different way? I, I definitely think it will be. That's something I've always thrived on, the, the technical aspect of, aspect of sprinting. You know, the little things that go into making a win, not just being the strongest, the fastest, because that makes it pretty simple really. And 
I probably wasn't ever the, the absolute strongest. Some days I was the fastest, but I won a lot of races by using my head and, and you know, studying the race book or just getting that bit of extra information, going out to scouting the finish if I could get to it. And that's the kind of thing I want to instill in our younger riders. You've got to do every little thing you can to make that difference. Because you're not always going to be the strongest or the fastest. You can still win races. Ladies and gentlemen, I could talk, as Phil could have talked earlier, all night to Robbie McKeown, but let me just tell you, this young man is a true Australian cycling legend. He is the best sprinter ever on the road from the of Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round for Robbie McKeown. Thank you, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for